morning, guys. Good morning. Um, so my name is Mario. I um, sorry, I'm gonna try to get some of this stuff figured out really quick. Um, I'm uh, the co-director at the CBI Bible College campus, or CBI uh, in Kauai, and um, that's my wife back there. Her name's Andrea, and um, so we're we're just blessed to get to visit with you guys. I'm kind of jealous that. Joe and Rebecca got to be here for an extra day <laughs> with you guys, but um, I'm glad I've gotten to, to meet some of you guys and, and hopefully get to chat more with you guys um, as we're here for the rest of this afternoon. So um, before we start, um, I actually have this little activity. So I'm the youth pastor at our church, and so anytime I get a chance to speak, I, there's always a game or something involved because that's just the way that I am. So um, why don't we do this? This is what we're going to do. My wife, um, for those of you who have airdrop or iPhones, why don't you take your phones out? Um, my wife is gonna airdrop you just a list of different events or books in the Bible um, that it's all in the Old Testament. There's 21 events um, and I want you guys to try to order or list these from the first, like chronologically, right? The first event to like the last one. So it goes from creation until the 40 years of silence, it's called the intertestamental period. That, so that's like all of the Old Testament. There's 21 different things that happen in between there. And so this is not a test. It's just for fun. Um, but I want you guys to, or I want us to, it, it's open book. So you guys can use your Bibles and see how far you guys can get through. The person who wins gets a really awesome prize, a high five from Joey. So um, you guys... Oh, a t-shirt. Oh, yeah. So winning. Wait, but it's a table. So five sure? No. <laughs> one person in your table will get one t-shirt. Let's go with that. You guys can vote or whatever. So my wife is going to airdrop to you guys. Once you, so make sure one person in your row has the list. You guys will have seven minutes because seven completed, seven completion. So you guys will have seven minutes to finish it. Yes. Just do this whole row. Yeah, your guys' row is a team. That This row is a team. That row is a team. You guys are a team. My wife, so, yeah, this, all you guys are a team. You guys will have seven minutes. Huh? They all have it? Okay, seven minutes starts now. Okay, I can send this over to you now. Let's see, share.
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. All right, I'm going to go off, or I'm going to read the list. Or did anybody finish? I had a mistake. Oh, you guys finished? Well, check them, babe. Check them. They got it? Okay, this table back here got it. Good job, guys. You guys got it? Oh, wait, 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 wait. We have another team who got it. Well, you guys should have told me you got who got it first. Well, it, was, it was like last second, so it's like. Okay. It was last second, so it's like. Uh, wait, are you saying this goes before the yes. Battle of Jericho? No, this comes. This comes after. Yeah, Gideon. Before the, yeah, it's after the Battle of Jericho. Because it's, it's a judge. Yeah, so this, so it goes. Gotcha, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll read the correct, yes. You got it also? Wait, who, who had it first? <laughs> read it? Okay, let's see. Or here, I'll read it all together. Yeah, okay. All right, all right, I'll read the order. Here it goes. It starts with creation. Boom, that was a hard one. Okay, second one, next one. Job. Job, Job, it's Job. Job. After that, Abraham. Then Exodus. Then the Battle of Jericho. Then Gideon and the 300. Then it's Samson and Delilah. Samuel anoints David. David and Goliath. David and Bathsheba. Solomon is given wisdom. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, kingdom split. Elijah taken into heaven. Israel taken captive by Assyria. King Josiah. <laughs> King Josiah crowned at eight years old. Judah taken captive by Babylon. Daniel prophesies. Zerubbabel leads a group back from exile. Esther marries the king. The book of Malachi, 400 years of silence. So if that's, that table got it all correct, okay. So you, you guys, one off. No, we have one off. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You guys, you guys decide amongst yourself who gets the CBI stick. Yeah, or, gotcha. Um, <laughs> no, I, did anybody else get only one wrong? Anybody else only one wrong? All right, you guys, you guys get it then. So you guys, you guys decide who gets the T-shirt, and then Joey will work that out with you guys with sizes and stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, um, so that it was like one that's kind of fun to do, I guess, or for me it's fun to do. Um, but two, uh, I, I just really wanted to share, or today as I was like praying about, or these last two weeks praying about, you know, Lord, what do you want me to share um, here at CBI? Uh, Joey was like, well, just share with them like what our heart is, what our heart is going to be at CBI Kauai, and then praying like, oh, Lord, what is my heart at CBI Kauai? And just thinking about a lot about Bible college and my testimony. So a little bit about me. I'll just share just a little bit of my testimony to hear my full testimony. You have to come out to Kauai, so um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. No, I'm just kidding. But a little bit about me, I, um, I grew up going to church, but uh, I wasn't saved until I was about 21 years old. I, uh, I knew about God, but I, I didn't follow him, and, um, and then just some things were happening in my life. I was not doing really, I wasn't doing well, and um, a lot of stuff, now that I look back, it, I could tell it was the Lord taking me out of a lifestyle that I was living. But a lot of stuff was like taken away from me, and, and I grew up in San Diego. And, um, and this lady at my church, um, I hadn't gone to church in a couple years, and this lady, I show up one day, and she gives my mom a check for whatever, how much money, to allow me to go to Bible college. She's like, this is, the Lord told me to give you this. This is so Mario can go to Bible college. And I was like, I don't know what Bible college is, but I guess I'll go. And a month later, I was on a plane to Peru, and, 
And uh, that's where I did my first semester of Bible college, and that's really where I got saved. And, um, and a big reason why, or I, I think what tugged on my heart um, that semester was uh, this class. We went through the book of Nehemiah. How many of you guys have read the book of Nehemiah? For those of you who have not, it's a really, really awesome book. And, um, and we, we had really cool classes that semester. We were going through the Gospel of Luke and Genesis and... Um, and we had a missions class, but the class that really changed my life was this, um, what was the, the book of Nehemiah. And really it was because of leadership. If you've read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah just does an awesome job at leading the people of Israel or Judah back into the land. And he rebuilds this wall. He rebuilds a wall around Jerusalem in 52 days. And so much of that book is talking about leadership and God using this guy and then this guy uh, just being really humble and being used by God. And, and me hearing that class, I was like, man, I really want to be used by God. And, and I, I grew up knowing that I had leadership qualities. And my mom, she would always say, like, Mar, are you going to lead people to do, good, to do good things or to do bad things? And really, for me, like, a basic definition of leadership is if people are following you. So a leader is just like if you have followers. And for us as Christians, if you, you, we all have influence and people are looking at you and viewing your life as an example, as a Christian, you are a leader. And so each one of us in here being leaders um, and realizing and recognizing that several years ago, um, I just wanted to lead in a, in a good way. And I wanted to lead um, God's people in a faithful way. And so that changed my life, which then led me to um, choosing this, I guess, topic or theme today is just leading through the word. And so we're going to look at a couple different characters in the Bible and how they led. But, but it wasn't just because they were talented or Nehemiah wasn't just like this outspoken, loud person, great teacher, whatever. But, but the characteristics and the attributes that these people had um, that I, I think that we can learn from today. So some leaders that we're going to observe or look at today, Jethro. He's a really cool dude. He's Moses' father-in-law. Um, Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Paul, and Jesus are just the leaders we're going to be looking at today and how they and their lives and the situations that they were in, how they led through the word of God, how they led using the word of God. Um, and so some attributes that we're going to observe in leadership, uh, preventing burnout, raising up other leaders, growing into servant, giving glory to God, prioritizing others' needs above your own, waiting to do the Lord's will, and just genuinely loving the people that you lead are just some attributes that I really love about, um, about leadership and that I think are key and essential. And as we look at these different characters, these are the traits or the attributes that I see in them. So why don't we pray, and then we'll, we'll jump into Jethro and looking at some of his leadership. So Lord, um, I just thank you for this morning, God. I thank you for uh, just all these students that you brought here, Lord. It, it was so cool just meeting some of them, some people you brought from just right down the mountain, Lord, um, some people you brought from different states, different countries. God, I just thank you that um, it was your hand that leads us, Lord. And um, God, I just pray that we would all be faithful to continue to follow that same voice, Lord, that led us to this point. God, that we would be sensitive to your spirit, Lord, as, um, as you wrote in John 16, the, the role of what the Holy Spirit does for us, that you guide us, you convict us, you encourage us, Lord. Um, may we just seek to hear from you today, Lord, as, uh, as the students have Genesis, um, they have this class, they have servanthood, Lord, and, and um, God, I just pray that our expectation would be to, to hear your voice today, Father, as we get to open your word. What a privilege. What a blessing it is um, that not a lot of countries have, or not every country has, Lord, to be able to come here, to laugh, to worship, to talk about your word so freely, Lord. May it be a privilege that we don't ever take for granted, Lord. So speak to us this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, cool. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about Jethro, him being our first leader. And I really love this, this passage. It's uh, in Exodus chapter 18. So if you guys want to flip over to Exodus chapter 18. So Exodus chapter 18. And so 
Who knows a little bit what happens in the book of Exodus? What's gone on so far? Yes, Francis. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they, they cr yes. Uh, they just the battle the and also take the water from the stone. Yes, that's what happens, right, in the chapter right before that. So the, the people, they were in Egypt. They exit Egypt. They're in the wilderness now. And so they've, they've gotten their manna. They've gotten some complaining out, the whatever, the battle of the Malachites. Famous story of Moses holding his arms up and then Aaron and Miriam supporting him so that way the battle can be won. And now we pick up in Exodus chapter 18 where Jethro, they meet in Midian. Jethro, again, is Moses' father-in-law. And so it, it's very early on during their time in the wilderness. And this is really, really important as Moses is continues to establish, establish himself as the leader. And, uh, and we're going to read what Jethro says. And so... Um, Let's start actually in verse 14. Now, when Moses, his father-in-law, saw that all, all he was doing... Oh, no, let's start in 13. It came about the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood about Moses from the morning until the evening. Now, when Moses, his father-in-law, saw that all he was doing for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, and all the people stand about you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me, and I judge between a man and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his laws. And so Moses, or Jethro, sees the situation. Moses is sitting from the morning until late at night, judging between, uh, between the people. So any problem, dispute, issue would come to Moses, and Jethro's like, well, wait, why? What are you doing? Here's more in depth, Jeth Jethro's response, verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. And so Jethro sees, this is an issue, Moses. You, you can't judge everybody all day, every day. Why? Because it's going to burn yourself out, but who else is it going to burn out? The people, right? The people are going to, they're going to be over it. Or they, they can't wait all day for you to give them an answer. And, and so here's Jethro's uh, suggestion. It says in 19, now, now listen to me. I will give you counsel and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God and you bring the disputes to God. Then teach them the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they, t they are to do. 21, furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. Last verse, 22. Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that every major dispute they will bring to you, but every minor dispute they themselves will judge, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. Okay, so Jethro, he, he suggests this thing. This is what you should do, Moses. Raise up other leaders. You don't have to solve every single issue. But, but it's not just anyone. What are some attributes that, that Jethro suggests to Moses? These people should have what? Okay, so they should fear God, able men. What, what else? Hating covetous, co 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 covetousness. covetousness. <laughs> men of truth, right? Those four things. And I love right before that in verse 20, it says, um, Jethro gives Moses, uh, or Jethro tells us to Moses, then teach them the statutes and the laws, make known to them the way in which they are to walk and the work they are to do. So Moses' job is teach them the word first. So teach them, and out of the people that you're teaching, then select these four people. So we're talking about leading. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about leading through the word today. And I love this part, and as we talk about ministry, or I'm going to tie this back into ministry, um, it always has to be about the word. And, and like I said, I'm a, I'm a youth pastor at my church, and what I always tell my leaders when either our kids act out or our leaders get frustrated at the kids, I always remind them like they're kids and kids are gonna be kids, so we shouldn't be surprised that kids, when they act like kids, that's like a whatever, tongue twister. But 
after that is the encouragement, like they won't know unless they're taught. And I love this verse in Romans chapter 10. It says, how will they, uh, uh, where is it at? Romans 10, 14, how will they believe if they haven't heard? And so they're not going to know the truth unless they're told it, right? And what Jethro is encouraging Moses to do is like, first, teach them the word. It's all about the word. And then those four things he talks about, men who are able. So actually in the Greek or in the Hebrew, sorry, in the Hebrew, what, what it's meaning by the men who are able or selecting people who are able, what's being described is a soldier. So someone who is equipped, ready for battle, um, in shape, ready to go off to war. So when we're talking about counseling people, what do you think Jethro is referring to? I'm a big fan of, of hand raisers, so if anybody has an answer. So if like that word or what Jethro is describing, people are ready for war, but Jethro is also talking about counseling people, leading. What do they need to be ready? How do they need to be ready? Yes. Um, like how the people need to be ready or how like, yeah. um, for war? Well, so, okay, sorry, I'm confusing question. What, what I'm trying to get at is these people, the people that are, are going to be eligible to lead, to, be, to being able, um, you have to be equipped. You don't just wake up tomorrow being ready to be a leader. No, it's, it's being equipped spiritually, being equipped emotionally, being equipped with the word of God. And so Jethro was like, don't just pick anybody. These people have to be ready for battle. These people have to be ready spiritually to be able to judge between what's good and what is wrong, what's right and what is evil. Next, he says, people who are trustworthy, people that he can depend on, people who, when they say that they're going to be somewhere, that they're there. People that, that when people confide in them, that they can be trusted. Next is someone who hates covetousness, someone who hates dishonest gain. Why, why would that be important as a leader? Yeah, exactly. So they don't get bribed to be swayed in, in one way or another. Yes. Okay, to help teach others. Yeah, so authority won't be corrupted, right? And so, and then the last one, fearing God, which might be the most important one. Why would the fear of the Lord be important as a leader? Yes. Yeah, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. It says tw uh, two different times in the book of Proverbs. And so for these four things, I, I really love. And I, I like that Moses, want, it's showing his humility here. How many of you guys, you can take a wild guess. How old do you think Moses is here in this chapter? Yes. He's older, yes. Yeah, he's around like 80 to 90 years old. He spent 40 years as a prince in Egypt, and then 40 years in the wilderness in Midian, and then he spends another 40 years in the wilderness. Most of his life is like these three chunks of 40, and this is in his third chunk of 40. So he's like 80 to 90 years old, and he's taking lessons from his father-in-law, which is really cool. Moses is very humble, but, but for us as leaders, for you guys, as I, I love what this program is. You guys do school for a year and then hopefully are sent out to do ministry. These four attributes you're going to need if you want to do ministry longer than a year, longer than two years. Um, Joey shared with me this statistic that uh, every, every um, or the average amount of time that a youth leader is in youth ministry is one year, and then they're done. And I've seen that firsthand where I've been, a, I was a student seven years ago. I served on staff at the Bible college we had in Kauai. And then having classmates and having students who would go up or would be so stoked to serve the Lord and then flame out. Students who were in awesome relationships, marriages, who are now divorced, seven years removed. These four things, um, they're characteristics, they're attributes that um, I can explain to you, but that you have to choose, that you have to do. Um, and it, it's stuff that, that isn't going to be uh, molded or shaped in a classroom. 
Hating dishonest gain, that's what my translation says. So uh, it, it's really prioritizing other people, being a trustworthy person, um, being able, being equipped, desiring those things. Uh, I, so I really love this, this passage, what Jethro talks about, um, what he encourages Moses with. And so why don't we go to our next character? Um, we're going to look at the life of Ez, uh, Zerubbabel. And so let's flip over to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. Ezra 4. So that's Jethro from the Prince of Egypt. If you guys haven't seen that movie, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know about that. So Ezra chapter 4. Um, so we just did our little timeline thing because it should help us for some of these characters we're going to be talking about. But who can tell me a little bit? Does anybody know what's going on during the time of Ezra? Ask Joel. Yes. Wait, what's your name? Kevin. Yes. Kevin. Yes, that is correct. Where um, what Kevin said is true. So there, there's a time in the Old Testament where really exile, captivity is such an important part of the Old Testament. If you guys are reading the Old Testament or reading the prophets and you're like, I have no clue what this guy is talking about, like Isaiah chapter whatever, whatever, like what, what are you saying? Uh, so much of it can be helped or you can understand a lot of the prophets, the majors and the minors, just based off of if you understand captivity and if you understand if Israel is captive or if they are not captive. And so uh, a lot of those prophets and even in the Kings and the Chronicles, so many people are looking forward to like warning of the destruction of if you don't turn from your ways, you will be captive. You will be taken by Assyria or by Babylon. And there comes a time where Israel and Judah, they're taken away captive by Assyria and Babylon. And now, picking up in the book of Ezra, Ezra has just come back, or Zerubbabel is leading the very first group of Israelites back into the land of, of Israel. So they were, they were away for about 70 years. That's the time that they had to be away from the land. And now that for the very first group back, um, Zerubbabel is leading them. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 4, um, and with that same context, Zerubbabel, I'm going to call him Big Z because I can barely, Zerubbabel is just very hard, so he's Big Z to me. So Big Z, he's leading these people back, and, um, and it's not just like this group coming back to this land and it's perfect. The, their land was destroyed. It was, it was wiped out. The words that are described to the people, they're, they're called captives even when they're in their homeland. They're called sojourners. Um, what's described of them is like that they're in turmoil. So they come back to this place that's very hard to live in. And so they return. And um, some things that Zerubbabel has to begin building up are like the houses, the temple that's destroyed. Um, Nehemiah is going to come 70 years later and rebuild this wall. But there's a lot of work to be done. Which then brings us to what um, Zerubbabel faces. What's then going to lead us into some more attributes of leadership. It says this in verse 1. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's household and said to them. Let us build with you for we like to seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esh-Sharavah king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's household of Israel said to them, you have nothing in common with us building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord, God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So let's pause. So is there a big work to be done? Yes, there's so much that needs to be done. And in Ezra chapter 2, um, it's just a genealogy that a lot of people just glance over. But what we know from this gene genealogy is estimated there's only about 2% of the Israelites return back into the land. So there's very few. There's like 76,000 people who return to Israel. 
Um, they need to rebuild houses. The temple is the big thing that Zerubbabel is trying to rebuild. And so there's a huge work to be done. And now here's this group of people that are like, hey, Big Z, can we help you out? Like, we, 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 we've been here um, because the Assyrians brought us here. And Zerubbabel and the other leaders immediately respond with no. And why do you guys think it was a no? Why do you think they didn't want foreigners helping out with the work? Yes? Because they wanted, like, they don't have, like, the heart, like, that the Israelites would have. Like, they're, first of all, they're, like, your oppressors, you know? Yeah. Second of all, why would you want your enemy to, like, help you? And they're probably going to, like, destroy you instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, they were enemies of Israel. Why would you want them assisting them? Really, and then if you think about, I know we're, this is like a lot of context for us, but a big reason why Judah and Israel were taken captive outside of the land was because they were worshiping false gods, because they intermarried people that weren't Israelites. They intermarried people that were around in the land. And so now them coming back into this land, allowing other people to then help out would maybe jump right back into that same cycle of allowing people to um, come and then to then influence which gods they're worshiping. And so Zerubbabel just says no. And I love that because as leaders, as we're talking about leading through the word, um, being able to discern from what's right and what's wrong. It's actually like it for not everybody is gifted with discernment. I do not have the gift of discernment where like making those decisions does not come like easy, easily or naturally to me. I was on this missions trip in Peru once, and um, and we were there and we were evangelizing, and uh, we were in a city we didn't know or I, I didn't know, and um, and we're evangelizing to these Jehovah's Witnesses, and we were we were able to speak English, and it was it was this really awesome thing. But we were talking for our whole entire time that we were supposed to be at this place an hour and a half, and then after that we were supposed to go and have dinner somewhere else. And so we're talking, and, and one of the leaders, it was a student leader, was like, hey, we gotta go to dinner. And I was like, no, we have to stay because this person, and we're evangelizing, this is more important. And, and I just like fought with this student leader. And, um, and so the student leader takes some of the kids to go to dinner. I stay back with two of the other kids. We end up getting lost and separated for our group, from our group for like three hours where we couldn't find where they were at. They weren't at the dinner spot. They weren't at the hotel. And it was just me and two. I was like 22, and it was a, it was a youth missions trip. So it was like a 15-year-old girl and like a 16-year-old girl. And we were like lost for three hours. And it, luckily, like nothing happened to us. But, um, but when we finally met back up with my leader, um, he, I got rebuked in, in such a good way where it was like, you're supposed to submit to your leadership. And because you did not, then now you guys have been gone. And if something would have happened, and, and there was this whole thing. But as I go back to it, discernment, it wasn't like, it's not something that just comes naturally to me. But as leaders, we all have to grow in discernment. And how do we grow in discernment? I love this verse in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verses... Um, 12 through 14. Let's flip there really quick. Um, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, it says this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. For a time, we're, we're, we've been taught. For a time, we were taught the elementary principles of what the word is, and then we must transition into solid food. And what that looks like is knowing the word of God. What that looks like is teaching. What that looks like is once you know the word of God, once you've been taught, now it's time for you to go and to teach you will grow in discerning between good and evil. So I think those two things, discernment and the word of God, they, they coincide. If you want to be able to grow into, in discernment, you got to know what this book is about. You got to know what's going on in here. You got to know, um, Lord, what should I do? Uh, you, you run to his word. I've heard it taught before. If you want to hear God's voice, read his word. If you want to hear him speak out loud, 
read the Bible out loud. Um, because, and it's so true where, like, if you want to hear God speak, just read your word. And us growing in discernment, knowing right and wrong, being able to make decisions like Zerubbabel on the dot, like, no, you guys can't help us out. You got to know your Bible. And so um, I was a Bible college student. And, uh, and I know that sometimes being in Bible college, it can just be mundane. Oh, it's my Chuck Trek class. Oh, this day we have this. And we can kind of sit and go through the motions. And I remember being in Bible college and hearing teachers talk about oh, well, your Bible college class, it doesn't replace your devotional life. Like, you got to keep spending time with the Lord, just you and God. And I was like, yeah, for sure, man, whatever. Like, <laughs> I'm reading my Bible like 10 hours a day. Like, I don't, this is my devotional time. And then coming out of Bible college, it was hard to start that process because I didn't do it for two years. And, and for you guys, like, as we're talking about leading, as we're talking about leading through the word, as we're talking about discernment, your commitment to the Lord, I challenge you guys, like, have a devotional life. You guys are three weeks into your semester. Like, start having, if you haven't started already, to have personal time with God. That means outside of class. That means outside of the elementary principles of you being taught. It's, it's, there's going to come a time where you teach. There's going to come a time where you need to discern between good and evil. And how are you going to discern that? Well, how, how much time have you been spending with the Lord? Do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? Do you even recognize his voice? Zerubbabel did, and he made a great decision. For us, we need to grow in discernment as we're talking about the word. So let's, um, let's now look at some of Ezra's life. If you guys want to go to Ezra chapter 7. Ezra 7. So Ezra 7, and as we're talking about the context of the word, um, chronologically. Ezra's chapter 1 through 6, it's about Big Z, Zerubbabel. He's leading. And then, bless you, from chapter 7 through 10, it's about Ezra and him leading. And between chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Ezra, there's about 70-year period that happens. And in that 70-year period is where the story of Esther happens. And so if you could split up the Bible, it would be 1 through 6, then the whole book of es- Esther, and then chapter 7 through 10, of the book of Ezra. And why that's significant, these are my thoughts. I think that's very significant because Ezra, he does the same thing as Big Z. He asks the king, hey king, can I go back to Israel? The king says yes. Not only does the king say yes, he gives Ezra like millions of dollars of articles of gold and silver and animals to sacrifice. And he tells Ezra, hey, go and sacrifice these to your God for me. And I think that this king, excuse me, um, Artaxerxes, he says these things because Esther was his grandma. And I think Esther had an influence or her Jewish influence on what then the kings did, the rest of the Persian kings did, or at least um, Artaxerxes, who allows Ezra to return to the land and he allows Nehemiah to return to the land. So the Bible doesn't talk about that. These are my thoughts. But that's why I think it's important to know the Bible chronologically, what happens. The 70-year gap between chapter 6 and 7 where the book of Esther happens, I think has an influence on what the king allows Ezra to do. And so we, uh, that's, that's what some things that happen in Ezra chapter 7. We're actually going to read in Ezra chapter 8. This is where he, he, in Ezra 7, the king commissions him, allows him to return to the land. And here in Ezra chapter 8, Ezra has people, he has all the material, he has everything ready, and he's like, all right, guys, let's go. And this is what it says in Ezra chapter 8, verse 15. It says, now I assembled them at the river that runs to Ahava, where we camped for three days. And when I observed the people and the priests, I did not find any Levites there. And so Ezra, again, he's about to return to Israel. Why would it be important to have Levites? Why is that a significant thing? Yes. They were supposed to be the ones to take care of the temple. Correct. They were the ones who were supposed to take care of the temple. The only ones, actually, who could take care of the temple, who can make sacrifices and do those things. And so Ezra notices this, and he's like, oh, this is a problem. Let's read what he does. So I sent Eleazar, Ariel, and then these are uh, a bunch of names from 16 to 17. And... Uh, And starting again in verse 18, according to the good hand of our God, 
upon us. They brought us a man of insight of the sons of Mali, the sons of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah and his sons and brothers. And then it keeps going 19 and 20 and talking about these men, but essentially 200 Levites come, bless you. 200 Levites end up coming um, because Ezra had sent word. And I think that's so important because in leadership, just like Jethro was like, hey, you need to commission other people to come. Like you need help with leadership. Ezra didn't view this as an opportunity. Like, oh, there's no more Levites? That's fine, I'm gonna take over. No, he, he, he knew that he needed more people to come and to help to do the Lord's work. And, and people came. But I love the phrase that's said in verse 18. In this chapter, three different times, Ezra's going to say this. Ezra is the author of this book. And he says, the hand of the Lord, the, the, hand of, uh, the, the good hand of our God uh, upon us, he attributes like this success to the hand of God blessing him. Ezra says that three different times. And so Ezra in this book, he's acknowledging like this is all from God. And now let's keep reading um, verse 21. It says this. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king's troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way. Because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him but his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. And so Ezra is like very honest with us here. He, he sits and they stay there and they pray and fast. Why? Because he was afraid. Because they were going with, again, they, they travel with, they, they list how much stuff they travel with. But in our today's money, it'd be millions of dollars, a couple million dollars worth of items they're traveling with without protection. And Ezra says this, he says, for I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy. And so as we're talking about leading through the word, um, I love how honest Ezra is here. So I think Ezra is a very slept on character in the Bible. He actually is, or he's an underrated character in the Bible, sorry. Um, because Ezra, he actually, he writes the, um, he writes the second most amount of verses in the entire Bible where he wrote the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, also the books of Chronicles. And, uh, and he, so it goes like Moses and then Ezra. It's actually crazy. And, and so um, I think he has a lot of weight, or at least for me, that, that means a lot. And for him to say, I was ashamed to ask the king for anything. So we need to sit and we need to pray. And so they sit and they pray, and then he gives all the credit to the Lord. Yes, did you have a question? He, he wrote Ezra, Nehemiah, first, and First and Second Chronicles. Yeah. And so that's according to Jewish history. The Bible doesn't say that, but most scholars believe that. So, um, so in verse 23, it says, So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. So what's going to happen here is, is Ezra is going to divide up the millions of dollars into 12 different leaders. They're going to arrive to Israel safely. And when they arrive to Israel safely, it says this in verse 31, the hand of our God was over us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and the ambushes by the way. He, he attributes all of his success to the Lord. And it might seem something, seem like something that's very obvious, like, oh yeah, giving God glory. Sometimes it's easy to not give God glory. I, I think a lot of the times, like, we pray or I can pray when I'm needing help, but when my prayer is answered, I, my prayers of thanksgiving or glorifying God are a lot less than my prayers of request. And right here we see that is not the case for Ezra, where they fasted, they prayed, and then now he's attributing all of his success to the hand of the Lord. And so one of my favorite verses in the Bible, we're going to backtrack just one, one page, or maybe it's on the same page for you guys. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10 says, For Ezra purposed in his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. And so this is where it started for Ezra. Where did it start for him? What does that first part of verse 10 say? He purposed in his heart to do what? To seek the law of the Lord. 
Ezra didn't just arrive at this place where now he's a, a great leader, where he wants to go and equip other people, where he recognizes, oh, I can't do this on my own. I need to humbly ask for help. Not only that, but now I need to humble myself and fast. Not only that, but I, I fasted, and now I'm giving all the glory to the Lord. He doesn't do these three awesome things just being a cool guy. No, it's because he purposed in his heart to first seek the law of the Lord, then to practice it, and then to teach it. There's a step to all of that. And so for us who are, who are seeking to, to do leadership, for us who are excited to be uh, an intern somewhere, for, for those of us who are in here seeking and wanting to pastor, it starts with purposing it in your heart. It starts with not, not purposing this idea, it, it's just purposing the word of God in your heart to study it. To study it, then to do it, and then you get to teach it. And when we do it the other way around, when we, when we maybe study and then teach and then I'll think about doing it, that's when our ministry fails. That's when our ministries uh, fall short. That's when we as human beings fall short. I love in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Jesus says the same thing, or the author of Acts, which is Luke, he says the same thing that, oh, Theophilus, he's writing the book of Acts to. Um, he says, oh, this is my second letter um, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Jesus did it first. Well, at what age did Jesus start his ministry? 30. Uh, like 30, right? Jesus lived out all the lessons he was going to do, and then he taught them. And so for us, how much more do we need to do that? How much more do we need to be studying this, doing it, and then you teach it? So I love that about Ezra. Um, I would encourage you guys to memorize that verse, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. It, uh, it, it really is so humbling, and, and it's such a great reminder, like, I acknowledge what you guys are doing here. You guys are setting aside a year of your life. Like, this is what I'm doing. I am purposing in my heart to study and then to do it and then to teach it. Um, as we're talking about discernment and, and stuff, I think for you guys or what I've experienced in Bible college is you're going to get more opportunity than you can handle. And something that my wife and I always talk about is for us or what we think is that opportunity can be the robber of success. Opportunity can be the robber of what God actually wants you to be doing. Just because something sounds cool or because something's going to be easier for you to, to do in the future. For me, I, um, I did Bible college for two years and then I was an intern on staff for the next three. And then I just thought I would be in full-time ministry. This is what I should be doing. This is where my heart is and that still is where, where my heart is. But then after that, for the next four years, I was working air conditioning. I'm still doing air conditioning right now. And for me, that was like such a hard thing to reason with. Like, God, I, I want to be serving you. I, I've been doing missions the whole time I've been saved. I, I love teaching your word. I love raising up other people. Why do I have to stay with this, this air conditioning thing? And what the Lord was teaching me, which took me a while to learn, which is probably why I was doing it for four years, but um, what the Lord was teaching me was just patience and waiting on his will and then really, really learning this lesson of success being the robber of what God is actually wanting to do. Because without that, uh, like I need those lessons of being patient, of being able to wait on his will. And what's happened in my wife and I's life is we've had opportunities to go other places. We've had opportunities to leave where we're at to, be, to have full-time ministry here on the mainland or overseas at different places. And we've been presented with these, but because of these lessons that I'm sharing with you guys of growing in discernment, of knowing his word, they were easy no's. It was like, no, that God doesn't have that for us. A little bit about the island of Kauai and youth ministry specifically is uh, Kauai is a very transient place. People come and go. Uh, I don't know what the average time, amount of time people spend there. But people either do like long vacations or one year stints or it's like, oh, I'm going to take my sabbatical in Kauai or I'm going to relax in R&R &R in Kauai for a year with my family. Very few people stay. And my kids know that. My youth kids know that. And, um, and so for us, Dre and I determined in our heart or when, 
the Lord called us to youth ministry, it's, it was, we, we want to be here for the long haul. We want to be here for our kids. We want to be committed to something. No matter what opportunities come our way, we don't want to be robbed of this success, which is just obeying God. Success is not numbers. Success is not how awesome is my youth group. It's just God has called us here. So all these opportunities are not going to rob us from obeying Christ. And, and so I share that all with you guys again with having this experience in Bible college, with having a bunch of friends who I can see their life and they're distracted by a new thing every single week. Oh, I have an opportunity to go and to pastor here, or I have an opportunity to do, oh, well, this church wasn't really paying me super well, so then I moved up, and this, these guys, you know, I didn't like their worship, so now I'm over here. What is God calling you to, and do you know his voice? Have you purposed in your heart to study his word, or have you only purposed to study his word for one year, or do you only purpose to study his word, Genesis, when it's Genesis class day, or do you only... Or are you doing it here for this short amount of time? And then what are your plans after this? Are you even considering serving the Lord where he wants you to be serving him? And so for me, it took me a long time to recognize what his voice was. And um, I keep talking about Peru for my wife and I. We both wanted to be missionaries in Peru. And um, it was like, like six years of us... Um, just like going back and forth and uh, like asking God, you know, where, where do you want us to be? We, want to, we've, we felt like the Lord was calling us to go to Peru and we felt like we wanted to be missionaries there. And, um, and doors just kept closing. Like I, I would go for two months and then have to come back and I would go for a month and have to come back. And then my wife and I got married and like... Um, like, our first trip was, well, we got to go to Peru. Like, that's where God's going to be calling us. And, uh, and doors just kept, kept closing. And, um, and us, like, coming out of that now, it's, um, it, w- it was such a bittersweet, like, to, to love two different places because we would, we would desire so badly to go to this one place. And then we, we would think about Kauai and we would think about our youth kids and we would just cry. It was just like, we're crying regardless of, God, where are you calling us to? And, um, and so for us, it, uh, it took us a while to recognize his voice. And um, with this, this last time, a door being closed, we were so relieved and so overwhelmed with peace and comfort and joy, knowing that God had called us to Kauai. And then, um, and then when God called us there, we were able to look back on the last two years and like, it was so obvious that the Lord was calling us here, but we just didn't know how to discern God's voice, how to discern good from evil. And for me, I forsook reading this. I got to a point where I was like, well, I know what's going on in here. And I, I took my time studying. I, I got to teach other people. And slowly but surely, my devotions just went on the back burner. I'm doing full-time work and ministry. Like, uh, I, can't, I can't spend time with Jesus today. Guys, your decisions that you make, obeying the Lord, knowing God, it's so contingent on your devotional life, on spending time with the Lord. And... Um, so yeah, Ezra 7.10, purpose in your heart to study his word. And, and that, that never ends. You don't graduate from studying his word. Um, let, let's take a look at Nehemiah's life. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. And really, this, this message could have been taught on just Nehemiah's life. If you haven't read it yet, he's a great leader. And, um, and I really like this chunk of verses. As I, when I think about Nehemiah's life, I think that there's sometimes skipped. And so if you think about Ezra or Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah, those three did three things. Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple. Ezra's purpose or job was to rebuild the people spiritually. And Nehemiah's job or purpose was to rebuild the wall. So if you can carp, 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 if you can, yeah, that word, Um, those three things, uh, those to me are the their responsibilities. So Nehemiah's responsibility, rebuilding the wall. Um, 
Let's just read some uh, Nehemiah's example. It says this, Moreover, from the day that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, for 12 years neither I nor my kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. But the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants uh, demeanored the people. But I, I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also applied myself to the work on this wall. We did not buy any land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 Jews and officials besides those who came to us from the nations that, we, that were around us. Now that which was prepared for each day was one ox, six choice sheep. Also birds were prepared for me. And once in 10 days, all sorts of wine were furnished in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on the people. Remember me, O God, for the good according to all that I have done for this people. And so Nehemiah, and this is like early on in his leadership, but he stays leading the people and he, um, or he, he leads the people for another um, I think 10 years after this. And what is said about him right here is that he didn't take his pay, where he was governing the people he was in charge, but he rejected the pay. Not only did he reject it, but he did just as much work as everybody else, if not more. And, and Nehemiah, um, uh, I think in the earlier ch in chapter 4, it talks about Nehemiah and the people working and how hard they were working and watching out for people who are going to come and attack, Nehemiah writes that he didn't even change his clothes because he was so like vigilant on, on not wanting like one opportunity for the enemy to come. So he doesn't change his clothes. He doesn't take his pay. Not only that, but he provides food for 150 people every single day. He doesn't buy any of the land. He wants to leave it for his people. And this is such a great example for us in leading. It's all about the people that you're leading. It's not about awesome events. And I do youth group and I love games. It's not about games. It's not about, it's always only about the people and you loving the people. We can't outgrow loving and serving the people. And I was talking to one of you guys. Oh, I was talking to Francis. And Francis, we were talking about ministry and he was like, I just love that I get to clean here. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, but it was so cool. He was like, I get to serve God by cleaning. And I hope that never, and I hope w the rest of you are like-minded with that. Like, yeah, I like serving God and cleaning. I hope we don't graduate from that. I hope you guys don't graduate from, th that is serving the Lord, the, those little things. And really that's beneficial for the people. I saw a lot of you guys putting away chairs last night at the men's thing. And, you know, I had, and I, I'm so guilty of this, honestly, where in Bible college, there's, we have this tent at our church that all the Bible college kids would set up and tear down each week. And once I graduated Bible college, it was like I did it for like a year or two after. And now it's like I got to get out of here before they start breaking down the tent. And it's so horrible. But that's like that is my heart now where I'm like, ah, oh, I don't need to serve. Those little things are it's loving your, the people. It's loving the congregation. Someone needs to vacuum. Because if no one vacuumed, you would come in here and notice, like, oh, this place is nasty. Maybe that would deter someone from coming back and wanting to stay. And, and so Nehemiah's example right here, um, Nehemiah, he, he wasn't about selfish gain. Or what, what was Jethro's advice? Like, people who have dishonest gain. He was always about the people. And so I, I love Nehemiah's example here in leadership. And for us... It's such a great reminder. Like in leadership, uh, it, it's all about loving people. And so we can't forget that. Um, we don't have to flip there, but in, earlier in Nehemiah chapter 1, where the same thing as Ezra, he didn't just wake up this awesome leader. Nehemiah hears about, or I guess you guys can flip there. Go ahead and go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Um, Nehemiah hears about the people. Nehemiah hears about what's going on in in. Jerusalem, and this is what it says about Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5. I said, or verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. A mighty work outside, or a mighty work in ministry, or a mighty work serving God, it always begins in the heart. It always begins in the heart of the people. 
where God placed this burden on him, and um, we don't have to really go into this a lot, but before Nehemiah asked the king, king to go back, Nehemiah waits and he prays for like three months. He hears this burden and he's just waiting on the Lord, praying for three months. He hears about this burden and he weeps and he fasts for days. And then he's able to do these things. Why? Because the Lord is the one who's strengthening him. Where, where not only is he, is he able to work on this wall, but he's able to forego his allowance. He's able to provide for other people. He, he doesn't want to buy any of this land. Why? Because God had already done a work in, in his heart. My prayer for you guys is that you'd be allowing the Lord to do a work in your heart. Um, for those who are second semesters and you know where you're going next, I pray that you would ask the Lord to do a work in your heart, to give you a burden for the people that you're going to be leading. It comes from God. It comes from his word. Let's look at one of our last sections, Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verse 17. Let's start in verse 17. So this is about my guy, Paul. Um, who, can, who can tell me uh, just a little bit about Paul? S- someone tell me about his life. Yes. Um, he used to uh, be like a religious leader, um, and he used to kill Christians. And yeah. Yeah, he was a religious leader, used to be Saul, would kill Christians. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, correct? Yes, from killing Christians to then becoming a Christian, yes. He was uh, in the desert with Jesus for three years. Yes, wait, he was where? In the desert, right? Yes, he was in the desert for three years. Yeah, I thought you said in the desert with Jesus. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is great that you said that because um, I think that's something that's forgotten about Paul. When Paul is converted or when God appears to Paul, it's in um, Acts chapter 9, and, and it says that the disciples were afraid of Paul. And so the disciples were like, we don't want anything to do with this guy Saul. And so Saul goes away for three years. And really, I think there, and a lot of people think that Paul was spent it studying, looking at the Messiah in the Old Testament, how this all made sense. And then he comes back equipped. And then he comes back ready to do missions. And then he comes back just as mighty leader. And he comes back, and, and then the disciples do end up accepting him. But from him going off and studying, like Caleb, yeah, like Caleb had said, um, I really think you get so much of his, of his heart here. Um, or a lot of what he ends up doing is because God first did a work in him. So God does a work in him. Let's read here in verse 17. From the latest, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And so what we're going to be reading right here in Acts chapter 20, Paul is wrapping up his third missionary journey. He's finishing it. And as he's going to Jerusalem, that's where the Spirit's leading him. He, he's passing by nearish to Ephesus. And those people he spent a lot of time with. And so he calls for them. He's like, hey guys, I'm going to be at this place. Why don't you come and meet up with me? Verse 18, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. And, and so Paul is reminding them, hey, guys, remember, remember how I served you. Remember how we went over what he's that then later going to say in verse 27, for I did not shriek from de- shrink from declaring to you the whole, your guys' translation says the whole counsel of God. And so really a, um, a reminder for us, again, serving other people, again, teaching the whole counsel of God. That's what it's about when we're serving other people. Um, 28 through 31, Paul is going to warn these people. Sorry, I'm going to kind of go a little bit quicker through my notes so we can finish on time. You guys finish at 930? 930, okay. I'll go. So 28 through 31, this is, again, Paul saying bye to these leaders he spent so much time with. He's reminding them, remember how I served you and how I taught you the whole counsel of God. Essentially, he's saying go and do the same. And then it, from 28 through 31, he, said, he talks about this enemy coming who's going to steal, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. 
um, them, but also those who he's leading. And so for us, great reminder, the people that we're leading, there is an enemy who's trying to attack them and which really should put a weight or a burden on us, like to take every moment that you have when you are leading, when you are serving the Lord serious. This is an opportunity for me and for me in youth ministry, my prayer every day for my leaders or when we get together and pray is that, that we wouldn't take for granted this time, but that this is an opportunity to impact someone's life for the rest of their life. Does anybody in here have a time or a message or a moment or a scripture that affected your life for the rest of your life? That maybe there's a scripture like Joey shared. I know that was one of your guys' questions yesterday of how did you know that you were called to Germany? And he was like, well, let me, let me show you what God told me. And he showed you guys. And, and what I love about that, or that you guys, a handful of you had those moments, is that anytime you open this word, that is a moment that God could be using to impact your life for the rest of your life. And so that's why I think it's important in verse 27 and for us in ministry that we wouldn't shy to share the whole counsel of God, everything, not just passages we're familiar with or passages that we love or passages that we've heard, but for us to get acquainted with everything that's going on and leading people in that way. So he warns them, verse 32, and, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you your inheritance among all those who are sanctified, attributing it back to the word, right? And then um, 33 through 35, always, again, having a heart for others. He never wanted to burden them. And then 36 through 38 is really the one I want to touch on in Paul's life. Um, I, I really love these verses. He said, it says this, when he had said these things, right before that, it is bl more blessed to give than to receive, again, living for others. 36, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and, and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. And so Paul, having spent time with these leaders, discipled these guys, had done ministry, and now Paul knows, and these guys know, man, we're never going to see each other again. And that brings him to a place of tears. That doesn't bring him to, um, like, you guys ever sign yearbooks in high school? You know, there's always, like, the, the sign, the person who would say just, like, hags, you know, <laughs> have a good summer. And that was like, oh, that's my friendship with this guy. Like, I'm, he's a hags friend. Where, like, that wasn't Paul and the people of Ephesus. They were so close to where, when it was a goodbye, it was weeping. When it was a goodbye, they were, they were weeping and giving each other godly kisses and hugging each other, embrace. Like, to me, the first time I read this, I was like, man, I would love if this happened one day. If, if I in ministry was so burdened or so grieved to never see someone again, that it would bring me to tears that I would be like, man, I just want to serve with you. Man, I, I've grown so much with you. Man, and, and then when this actually happens, so this is a twofold. I think, one, this should be your standard in ministry. At least it's mine. It doesn't have to be yours. But for me, it's my goal, like, to have relationships. The Bible talks about it so much. In Galatians chapter 1, it talks about bearing one another's burdens. In Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about... Um, Sorry, let me, I'll get those verses for you guys, the ones I'm talking about. Um, it says in, um, in Hebrews 10 how we should consider how to stir one another up. It should be on our mind, like, how can I encourage my brother today? That should be what you guys are doing here. Um, in Galatians 6, 2, again, bearing one another's burdens. In Romans 12, 10, it says, loving one another to outdo one another in showing honor. So our standard as Christians, again, living our lives for other people it should be, how, how can I get closer to this person? How can I serve this person better? How can I outdo this person in honor? How can I consider? How can I think? How can I, like, I know this person is into this, into coffee. I'm going to go buy them a coffee. How can I encourage this brother or sister? And for Paul, he did all those things well, and it brought them to a place, a closeness, a friendship that caused them to weep when they were gone. So for me, it's always been a standard. And then a warning, um, because no one warned me about this. It sucks when you have to say bye to somebody like this. And um, it's like such a bittersweet where you've, for me, this was accomplished finally. Like I, I'd read this when I first got saved. And then um, uh, just recently I had this, this youth 
youth kid I've been discipling for two years. And in a disciple, in someone that you're pouring into, you want them to understand. You want them to listen to the things that you're encouraging them with. Like, how many of you guys have ever discipled anybody in here? In here? And so for those of us who have discipled, it kind of sucks when you're like, hey, dude, try this next week and we'll touch base on this. Like, I'm big on reading books with people. Like, hey, read this chapter and we'll talk about it next week. And then you meet up and like, hey, did you read the chapter? This is what I got of it. Oh, no, I didn't read it. Okay, we'll get it next week. Hey, did you read the chapter? No, I didn't. Did you? No, I didn't get to. And so when you have disciples like that, it's like it's a different working through. But for the, the disciples who get it, it's like, oh, yeah, I read this chapter. And then they're like sharing things that you didn't even see. It's like, whoa, that was awesome. Okay, hey, how about you try this? And, and then this person just got it and he understood everything. And the things I encouraged him with, he did. The things I asked him to stop doing, he did. And it's not about someone like obeying me. But this guy was getting closer to the Lord and I could see that. And then he moved away from Kauai. And it, it was like, this kid's like 12 or 13, but he was like my best friend for two years. And um, and I just think, um, it's a good standard to have. I love what... Uh, Romans 12, 9 says, love genuinely. And in the ESV, it says to love without hypocrisy. And um, I love that verse because it's so easy to not open up to people. It's so easy for this not to be your standard. It's so easy to clock in and to clock out of the ministries you're doing. Even for those of you who know you're not going to be here in Joshua Springs for the rest of your lives. It's easy to just go through the motions of things. And my prayer is that you guys would love genuinely, that you would love without hypocrisy, that it, it would be something in your ministry that, that you, you would be genuine people and that this would be your standard in ministry, that when you leave each other, it's not like, oh, I'm counting down the days till I can leave this guy because his feet smell bad, <laughs> or I'm counting down the days to get out of here because... Uh, you know, and, and insert X, Y, and Z. One of my favorite passages, this is kind of a weird passage, but in Numbers chapter 11, um, the, the people in Israel are complaining. And so the Bible says that the earth just swallowed them up. Like, <laughs> I just think it's such a weird, like, why did God, they just got swallowed. But it was like the people on the outside of the camp were swallowed up because I, I think complaining and being far from God they, they coincide. And so my heart for you guys or my desire for you guys, that you would love genuinely. And if you have hearts that are complaining already in week three, you guys have a couple, a lot more weeks after this, like correct those things already. And if you already have hearts that are bitter, correct those things already. I, I, my prayer is that you guys would send me videos at the end of the semester, like we're weeping, this sucks. Like we're saying bye finally. Um, that this, this passage would come alive. And to me, like, it's not that tears prove anything, but, but God knows your heart. And I pray that your heart would be for each other, for the people that you serve. So very last one, and we could have just started on this one and really ended on this one, it's Jesus. And I love this chunk of verses. If you guys want to flip over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Galatians 2, 5 through 8, it says this, Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. Your guys' translation probably says, and have this mind, this mindset that Christ also had. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, but emptied himself, taking the form of, of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And so I love these chunk of verses. It's Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And it talks about what Christ's mind was. What was Christ's mind? Well, he was a bondservant. A bondservant was the lowliest of servants. A bondservant is more than just a servant. When you're in, 
uh, a servant in Israel, you would serve for seven years and then you were free. Max, seven years. And a bond servant was someone who fulfills their term seven years. And then after that, they're like, hey, man, I really like it here. Can I just live here and be your servant for the rest of your life? And the master would usually say yes. And then he would give them an earring. Yep. And, uh, and then they were just a bond servant, a doulos. That's what the word is in Greek. And, and so Jesus was the lowliest servant of us. He came not to be served, but to what? to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Verses that we know, but put this mind on. That's what is being encouraged to us. So three things, that you would all be servants, that we would be servants just like Christ was. Then the second thing, that he humbled himself in humility. So as we're talking about serving in the word, serve it, or as we're talking about leading in the word, being a good leader who leads through the word, it starts with having that acknowledgement of wanting to serve others having a, a heart that is humble, and then having a heart that is obedient. Those three things, that's, that's what Christ was. That was his mindset. So as he lived on this earth, as he was tempted in every way that we were tempted, right? That's what it says in Hebrews. How did he, how did he overcome all of that stuff? Well, he acknowledged, I, I'm here for others. I'm here to serve others. And I'm going to do it in a way that I don't need credit. I don't need to be whatever. Um, I don't, even though he was God, he still came to this earth, and he, he said, the Bible says about God that he had no place to lay his head, where the king of kings came and lived a humble life. For us, how much more humble do we need to be? And then the last one, being obedient, even, or what Christ, as much as Christ was, it says obedient even to the point of death, that we would pick up our cross and follow Jesus daily. And so um, that, that's what I had for you guys today, just talking about leading and leading through the word. So as you guys are, are going to be uh, serving throughout today, as you guys are going to graduate eventually from here, um, as hopefully, Lord willing, some of you guys join us in Kauai, that, um, that you guys would lead through God's word and that these things would be on your mind so that, that what we talked about with Jethro, how it, was, it first started with teaching, but then that you would all be able. Are you able to lead? Are you equipped to lead today? If not, how do we get there? That you would be trustworthy people, that you would be honest with yourself. Am I a trustworthy person? Am I reliable? And if you're not, how do I start correcting that stuff? Do, am I about selfish ambition or do I hate dishonest gain? Lord, strengthen me to hate dishonest gain. I, I don't want to prioritize myself, but to prioritize Christ. And then finally, fearing God. Do you fear the Lord? Do you actually have a reverence for him? Um, and then talking about Zerubbabel, how growing in discernment. Growing in discernment is growing in his word. Talking about Ezra, giving all the glory to God. And if we at all are ever taking glory, that we would ask God to humble us. And really, one of my favorite verses is in Psalm 139 at the very end of that chapter. It's David's prayer. And he says, oh, Lord, search me and know me. Try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. That needs to be all of our prayer. Because Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, that your heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? So for all of us, it's like, man, my heart is wicked. My intentions could be wicked. I don't even know it. God, I need you to search my heart. Am I taking glory or credit for anything? Nehemiah, he was humble and his life was about others. Paul, he loved genuinely that that would be your guys' love. And then Jesus, finally, those three things. He was humble, he, he was a servant, and he was obedient. And so I hope that ministered to you guys. Um, we can pray and then you guys have your own schedule and stuff. Uh, Lord, I, I just thank you for today, God. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the leaders that um, we were able to look at in your word today. God, um, just people that were just so in love with you and that you could tell that uh, just had relationships with you that, that heard from you, Lord. May we be uh, men and women who hear from you, God. If we want to hear you speak, may we read your word. If we want to hear you speak out loud, may we just read your word out loud, Lord. And and, um, and may we expect to hear from you today, Lord. Again, that same prayer I prayed in the beginning, I thank you for your spirit um, and what you said, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would be our helper and that he would guide us and he would convict us, that he would exhort us. Lord, I pray that you would do your work. And as you're doing your work, may we, be, uh, may we have eyes that, that are opened to, uh, to hearing, to recognizing your voice, Lord. So I pray that you would continue to grow and mature these men and women, Lord. Um, after this year or however long they spend here.
God, may, may they be sensitive to that voice to be able to discern between right and wrong what you're wanting them to do, what your will is, and what it's not, Lord. And, uh, and so strengthen us today, Lord. May we serve you. May we love genuinely the people that we serve. Um, it starts with the person to our right, to our left. Lord, um, may we love genuinely without hypocrisy. In your name, amen.